Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, both of the witnesses for joining us this morning. In my view, whenever Congress acts in the area of political speech, the touchstone for everything we do should be the First Amendment to the Constitution. And I think that the public should be particularly skeptical when you have elected politicians of either party enacting rules limiting the ability of public citizens to criticize the behavior of their elected officials. In my view, the First Amendment was created precisely to ensure that the citizens could speak without the men and women who sit in this body restricting what they say. And I think there are few areas that are more dangerous to have the government engaged in prior restraint or punishment after the fact for private citizens who would choose to speak out on politics. Indeed, of all the areas of speech, we have long lines of cases extending free speech protections to all sorts of questionable activities, including things like nude dancing. And that's a, a well-established line of cases from the Supreme Court. But of every possible area of speech, I think there is none more central to the core purposes of the First Amendment than political speech, than the ability of every American to speak up and express his or her views on the direction of this country. Uh, and I would point out that, that in saying this, I, I am not unfamiliar with the downsides. Uh, in Texas, I just came through a campaign where I was on the receiving end of $35 million in attack ads and was outspent three to one. And let me say, those who chose to put resources into launching attacks against me had a First Amendment right to do so. And God bless them for speaking out and being involved in politics. And, and I think we should all be concerned about those who are elected to office and immediately want to prevent anyone from speaking and being engaged in the political process or saying something they don't like. Now, Ms. Rahman, I'd, I'd like to ask you a few questions about your, your testimony. Uh, the first thing I'd like to ask is, is, in the Department of Justice's opinion, what is the government interest in regulating the independent expenditures of private citizens? Well, uh, we obviously understand... I think your microphone holding... needs to come on. I'm sorry. <coughs> We understand fully the holdings of the Supreme Court in this area, and we are not suggesting regulation of independent expenditures. Our challenge as corruption prosecutors is something altogether different. Our challenge as corruption prosecutors is to be able to understand when those independent expenditures really aren't independent, where there is the kind of illegal coordination where the expenditures become contributions and become an end run around the contribution limits that have long been recognized by both Congress and courts around the country. And that is our concern. We want to be able to have the tools that we have always had to be able to follow the trail of money, to be able to follow the paper trail, to be able to determine whether there are bad actors who are illegally trying to influence our elected officials through um, by providing donations to PACs that are illegally coordinating with the campaign. And that is our challenge now. It's simply a different challenge post-Citizens United. M Ms. Robin, I, I want to make sure I understand your question. If I understood you correctly, you said that the government interest was in investigating and or prosecuting expenditures that were not independent, that were coordinated directly with a candidate or a campaign. Um, is it fair then to infer that, that the answer to the question I asked about does the Justice Department, is there a government interest in regulating independent expenditures? In other words, those expenditures that are not coordinated. Is it fair to infer that, that your statement is there isn't a government interest or, or, or is there a government interest? I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I'd, so I'd like to know what the, what the department's view is. Well, I'm not going to speak holistically for every circumstance in which there may be some, some law or regulation passed that may be viewed as, a, as affecting independent expenditures. But I am here to tell you that our primary um, purpose is to ensure that our campaign contribution limits are robustly enforced. And we are simply hampered from doing that now given that um, it's all, it, we just simply don't have the tools that we used to have to determine whether or not 
super PACs are illegally coordinating with, um, with but campaigns. Today, the Justice Department is not articulating any government interest in regulating independent expenditures of private citizens. Is, is, is that correct? T today, I am here to tell you that our interest is two, twofold. One, we want clear and common sense understanding of what coordination is so that we can do our job as robustly as we have been able to. And number two, we need transparency in the way our campaign finance system works so that if a donor is in fact using an organization like a 501c4 to hide their, hide their identity, that we somehow be able to get that information. Let me, let me focus on the second part of your answer there. You, you said that the department has an interest in, in transparency. Does the department have a view on whether the First Amendment protects a right to anonymous speech? Again, I cannot get into every hypothetical in which um, we might have some interest in, um, in uh, talking about anonymous speech. I, and I'm certainly not here to suggest that our goal is to impede an, uh, the lawful ability of individuals to speak on behalf of elected. Ms. Rahman, I'm, I'm asking what I think should be a, a fairly straightforward question. I mean, the, the department is testifying today in support of legislation forcing disclosure of political speech. And my question is, does the department believe the First Amendment protects a right to anonymous speech? That, that, that's a question that goes right to the heart of your testimony. I, th I think, Senator Cruz, more important than what the Justice Department thinks, the Citizens United, the Supreme Court, upheld a disclosure regime and found it fully consistent with the First Amendment. And we believe that the kind of disclosure regime that the Supreme Court upheld in Citizens United is critical to our ability to continue to understand. Does, does the department think it would be permissible under the Constitution for the federal government to require the NAACP to disclose a list of all of its members? I am certainly not here to suggest that that is what we are asking for. I mean, as you know, the Supreme Court held that can't be required. And, and Senator Cruz, I'm certainly not here to suggest otherwise. What I am suggesting is that there is a risk that we have seen of, of bad actors using the anonymity that's given to them uh, when they disclose to 501c4s to hide the true purpose of their, of their donation. And we need to be vigilant about that. We need to be able to determine when those donors are acting with bad intent and frankly, when a campaign or an elected official may be knowingly allowing that kind of donation to occur uh, intending to be influenced in some corrupt way. That is our job. We need to ensure that we are robustly and uh, um, vigorously enforcing the Title II, title the campaign finance laws, but also that we uh, vigorously enforce our corruption laws. And um, it is not, um, it, it, it's certainly been the case that we've had certain, several cases in which con campaign contributions are in fact a part of the quid pro quo that goes into the heart of a bribery case. Okay. Th thank you very much. I appreciate your being here this morning. Thank you.